a tiny toy town world beyond the reach of most of us. The plaything of a privileged elite who dominate politics once more. Is this what Westminster has become? Three quarters of the coalition cabinet are millionaires. David Cameron, Nick Clegg and George Osborne went to schools that now charge fees higher than the average wage. And a third of today's Labour front bench went to Oxford or Cambridge. So how has our politics become the preserve of the privileged once more? Why did it happen, especially at a time when cuts in public services are at the top of that place's agenda? Does our new political elite understand or appreciate what these cuts could mean for ordinary voters, people whose lives are light years from their rulers? In this film, I get under the skin of the new political ruling class. I'm a man of the people. Vox Populi, Vox Dei. To reveal a system that's blocking many bright youngsters from reaching the top. I would love to go to St Andrews, but there's a very little chance that I'll get in. I just simply don't know anyone. It's called the Scottish Oxford for a reason. For generations, our public school boys have been bred to rule. You knew a great many people, um, simply by having been to Eton, and doors were open to which were closed to others. But for a time, it seemed like politics was changing. For the first 18 years of my life, I lived over the shop which my father owned and ran. Now public school boys are back, dominating public life like they used to. If David Cameron uh, had gone to an industry comprehensive, he'd be lucky to dig ditches for a living. And the Labour Party's getting more middle class too. I'm a member of the Labour Party, 47 years. I've refused to vote this year because I couldn't vote for a working class candidate. Um, and, and that's got to change. Politics is getting posh again, and it's driving people away. You're not just seeing things getting posher, you're seeing things getting narrower as well. Westminster has become a closed shop for the privileged, but do we have to resign ourselves to it getting posher still? Order! Order! Never mind his politics. Gordon Brown's departure from Downing Street last year was historic. It marked the end of Britain's great post-war experiment in political meritocracy. Out went a grammar school boy, the only university-educated Prime Minister who hadn't gone to Oxford or Cambridge. Coming the other way, two public school boys, who both went to Oxbridge and who were both part of the political elite by their 20s. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied, Nick Clegg, and Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? <laughs> I, we're all going to have... I, I'm afraid I did oh, once. Right. I'm, I'm, uh... <laughs> Uh, we're all... Come back! Not so much PM and Deputy PM as head boy and deputy head boy. Don't be surprised by how comfortable they look together. After all, they come from the same very comfortable backgrounds. David Cameron is the son of a stockbroker. Nick Clegg's father, a bank chairman. Mr Cameron is fifth cousin twice removed to the Queen and went to prep school with Prince Edward. His wife is the daughter of an eighth baronet, descended from Charles II. Mr Clegg is a descendant of the Russian aristocracy. His grandfather was a top Dutch financier. His wife is the daughter of a Spanish senator. Mr Cameron went to Eton, where he met future London Mayor Boris Johnson and many of his current government. Mr Clegg went to Westminster School, where he acted with Helena Bonham Carter, daughter of a liberal dynasty. After Oxbridge, by their late 20s, both were political special advisers. Cameron to Tory Chancellor Norman Lamont, Clegg to Tory Euro Commissioner Leon Britton. It's one of the great mysteries of 21st century Britain, made all the more mysterious because almost nobody wants to talk about it. I'm one of the grammar school generation. I grew up part of a post-war meritocracy which slowly began to infiltrate the citadels of power through ability and ambition rather than background and connections. Of course, the public school educated still held a disproportionate share of the top jobs, but we were in no doubt the meritocracy was here to stay. It never dawned on us that at the start of a new century, it would have ground to a halt. Few politicians want to admit to what's happening 
David Davis, working class boy turned leading Tory politician, is an exception. We come from roughly similar sort of backgrounds. Yeah. Do you think someone from our kind of background today would have the opportunities that we had? Oh, no. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, you can never say there'll never be another working class prime minister or whatever, because right through centuries of history, the people have made it from the bottom to the top. But the odds are much, much worse today than they were when you and I went through school. This is a symptom of a much bigger malaise, you know. Uh, and social media has, has stalled. You know, we do have a stratified society. Politicians used to boast of their long journey to power. But for Nick Clegg, it's a mere three-minute walk from the back door of Downing Street to the rather special front door of his old school, Westminster. It was founded in its present form by Elizabeth I in 1560, and over the centuries has educated seven prime ministers and politicians as varied as Nigel Lawson and Tony Benn. The headmaster here is Dr. Stephen Spur. I guess if, you, if you're well educated here and you're interested in going into a political career at some stage, it's not a big jump from here uh, to over there, is it? Uh, well, is I that why you've had seven prime ministers? Well, I think, I think there's, there's, that's definitely something to do with it. Parliament is not something which is a huge distance and unreachable. It is, it is, it is part of the cultural, historical and mental space that Westminster has here. It's not just for them, it's for it, us. Ex exactly. From these boarding uh, windows here, they tell their time by Big Ben because they look and they see Big Ben uh, out through there. We use it, as it were, I think, to try to inspire very bright children who are here. It's an academically selective school. To inspire them to have that intellectual reach, that appetite, that ambition. Good afternoon. And that ambition was certainly on display when I dropped into an A-level economics class. What is it about the school that produces politicians? You've got Nick Clegg, you've got Chris Hume, you've had various others. I think there's something different about Westminster. It's, like it's not the teachers that push us to be the best that we want to be. It's we want to be the best that we want to be. It's this kind of mentality that you, that you get being here. And it's each other. You don't, you don't want to be the, the person at the bottom of the class, so... Uh, but if you see all your friends working, you're not going to kind of be the one person who's like, oh, I can't be bothered. I think the opportunity for networking is greater here because um, there's lots of different people. So there's always opportunities to meet new people and, well, their parents might do something that you've never, like, heard of before. You've got lots of opportunities for what you might want to do. Any of you interested in going into politics? Yeah? How did I work that out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I suppose the reason why this school does produce uh, quite a few politicians is that we're so close to the political system. I mean, there's always a big protest going on outside, or there's a big speech being given, um, or there, you know, there are helicopters, there are helicopters all the time, people camping out on Parliament Square. So we're very much sort of immersed in the, uh, in the sort of British political system, and that's why, whether you like it or not, if you're at this school, you're going to be interested to a, to a greater or lesser extent in politics. Here, we're constantly talking about politics. Mm. We encourage a lot of articulation of, the, of, of one's own voice, one's own ideas, one's own opinions. We test them, however. Mm. That's part of just the way the teaching happens here at the school like this. Public schools like this have always been a privileged pipeline into politics. And though things seem to be changing after the Second World War, Today, the public schools are back in the ascendant. Only about 7% of us go to fee-paying schools, yet half the cabinet and a third of all MPs did. And after falling steadily for decades, the number of public school boys in parliament is on the up. The biggest conduit in this pipeline to politics. Eton, the school that over the years has produced 19 prime ministers. 13 Tory ministers wear the same old school tie. Even half a century ago, Labour was able to make political capital out of Eton's dominance of the Tories. You know, it's fascinating to look at the background of Tory ministers. 
and to see how they're linked together by business or family ties. Former Foreign Secretary and Auditorian Douglas Hurd knows all about the head start a public school education can give you in politics. We're taking tea at his exclusive London club. What is it about Eton that has produced so many prime ministers, so many politicians like yourself? Did they make you think you were born to rule? No, you weren't born to rule, and it was quite clear that nothing was going to be given you on a plate. Mm. But it wasn't that you were grooming yourself to be a prime minister. That would have been absurd. Mm. If you were interested in politics, as I was, um, well, then, of course, you, 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 it was a good place to learn about it. Historically, in the big chunk of the 20th century, to have gone to Eton was an advantage in a political career, to reach the highest levels. I don't think it was a substitute for intelligence or hard work. You had to add those. Mm. But I, I agree. I mean, it was it, you, you knew a great many people um, simply by having been to Eton. And doors were open to which were, were, were closed to others. But by the time Hurd stood for the Tory leadership in 1990, being an Etonian had become a drawback. His poshness was a handicap and a reason why he lost to the humbler John Major. Yet 15 years on, when David Cameron stood for the leadership, it seemed less of a problem. The one piece of advice I, I gave to David Cameron was don't let that issue gallop away with you, and he didn't. He, he nailed it. He said at the beginning what I only said at the end, and when it was too late, um, I'm standing for the leadership of the Tory party, not for some demented Marxist outfit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which I think was a crucial point to make. David Cameron is, is, is an obviously and uh, strongly intelligent person. And that's why he's Prime Minister. It's not because he went to Eton. It's not because the, the, the fact that he was at Eton has been a total obstacle. It hasn't been. Of course, having had the best education money can buy shouldn't disqualify anybody from high office. But it's surely a sign of our fading meritocracy that Odetonians are ruling the country once more. There are now 20 old Etonians in the Commons, up five on the last parliament, and a remarkable eight are in government. That's right, eight ministers went to the same school, the one with the historic buildings, the archaic uniforms, and a price tag of almost 30 grand a year. They protect that privilege jealously. Few are allowed inside its hallowed halls, ourselves included. So we sought out a couple of recent old boys to find out what it is about the school which produces so many ambitious political high flyers. You're going up to Oxford this term yeah. and you're already there so you yeah. both both will be at Oxford together. So and actually arriving at university you, I, I realized that actually the facilities here are a lot better than the ones at Oxford. <laughs> So, really? Me, You've yeah. got a better science, <laughs> better science lab at Eton than you have at Oxford. Yeah, <laughs> and it's funny, isn't it? Do you have any sense when you were there, why did Eton produce so many politicians? Politics-wise, because all the societies are boy-run, and often the leader of the society next year will be elected by boys. So there's almost already a lot of... Um, a lot of politics just in, in terms of trying to get elected and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think that's a very, very healthy thing, as in competition is actually encouraged throughout the school, because after all, life is, is a competition. So it's a clear advantage to have gone to Eton, but there are some disadvantages. Whenever someone asks what school you went to, you're always a little apprehensive and you say Eton, and there does tend to be a certain expectation that you'll be a posh toff who's very snobbish. But I feel it's just part of our job to try and show that we're, we're not, not, we're not. that stuck <laughs> yeah. up and arrogant most of the time. Somerset. Dairy country. A village festival. And local Tory MP Jacob Rees-Mogg. Just one of the half dozen new Old Etonians elected to Parliament for the first time in May. And less bothered, it seems, than the boys about being perceived as an Etonian toff. Even in 2010, we seem to be governed 
by a political elite from a narrow background. I think this is the class warfare that the Labour Party wanted to fight at the last election that failed. I'm mean, think it's utter nonsense that we want to have the best people available to govern us, the best educated, and the people that the electorate will vote for. If the electorate wants to vote for people who have been at private school, that's their right. And I, I think you get into danger of having a rather trippy argument about people's backgrounds. As David Cameron said, it's about people, where people are going, not where they've come from. Why did Tony Blair become the leader against Gordon Brown? The answer's obvious, because he actually could connect and communicate with people, and the fact that he'd been at Fetty's was irrelevant to that. So I, I, I don't think social background helps or hinders a political career. You God. think I'm coming at this from a left-wing socialist point of view? I, I'm not. No one would dare call you a left-wing socialist. I'm coming at it from a very different point um, of view. Being posh didn't stop Jacob winning, but it was an issue at the general election for Jacob's sister, who stood for the Tories in a neighbouring seat and lost. Your sister, who was fighting the seat next door, her name is Annunciata Rees-Mogg. Right. Now, we understand Mr Cameron wanted to change that to Nancy Mogg. Well, the, the, the good... How, how, what would you have felt about that? The good news is she's about to change her name, but to Annunciata Glanville. Right, she's about but, to answer, but answer we're, the we're... question. It was a How did you feel about it that? A, it was a joke. It was? Yeah, 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 it was a joke. Is this a dynasty we're trying to create? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. It's yeah, a yeah. pretty narrow social group fighting politics right well, well, here. Come on, my father's <laughs> never been a member of parliament. No, he's in the he's House, in of, House Lords. of Lords. But he's, he, you know, he's not an MP right here. Uh, I, uh, I think creating a dynasty would be rather ambitious. What class are you? I, I think it is for others to, to do. I'm um, a man of Somerset. But that's where you're from. That's where I'm from. Geographically, and I, and that's where right. are you? And I, I mean, have, I would say... I have, uh, this will probably hurt you. I would say sort of upper middle rather than upper. Well, I'm certainly not part of the aristocracy. That's definitely true. So we settle for upper middle? I'm a man of the people. Vox populi, vox dei. Well, class is a complicated business in modern Britain. I grew up in a council house in Paisley. These days, I live in Kensington, the poshest borough in London. I'm not a toff, but I now live a lifestyle many posh people live, such as having a housekeeper and a driver. Of course, in my case, it was hard work and ambition rather than daddy's money. But it was also because I grew up at a time when social mobility was on the rise. I had a world-class education at the 16th century Paisley Grammar School and the 15th century University of Glasgow. Grammar schools were the ladder of opportunity. Kids from ordinary backgrounds climbed into some of the country's top jobs. But with most grammars gone, I fear it's harder for someone from my background starting out now. If my mother was still alive, she'd say I'd look smart. I'm heading back to Paisley to see how kids there are doing in this comprehensive era. Hi, Vanessa. When I was a kid, I used to watch all the political programmes on television, the news, panorama, the world in action, what the papers say. Uh, with my pets, kind of sad, but it's true. Here you see the pick of us. You may be heartily sick of us still with sense. We are all imbued. Our home A world where weekends on the grouse moor with your chums was the norm. I remember in the 1950s, it was dominated by people like Harold Macmillan and so on. And they clearly came from a different planet from me. They were from an entirely different class and social background and spoke with these strange accents that you only heard on television. How many votes did we get at the last election? I think 12 million, something like that. They certainly weren't all the world to do. A hundred years ago, there were deep divisions between rich and poor, great cleavages. But we've made one nation now. There are differences, of course, but not the deep divisions. I'd like to come to see you in person to show you that I'm not exactly what they make me look like on the TV screen. <laughs> and then 
think this amazing thing happened in 1964. I like it, I like it. This guy with a, a northern accent, a Yorkshire accent, and a pipe and kind of ordinary suits of the type that my father wore. Harold Wilson, you began to think something's changing here. So this is what 1964 can mean. A chance for change. More than that, a time for resurgence. A chance to sweep away the Grouse Moore conception of national leadership. <laughs> type of politician had taken over much more from ordinary backgrounds than, than ever before. And when that happened, it looked like it, it was permanent. I like it. Are you liking it too? The sort of streets in which I grew up were becoming the kind of place political leaders from any party might come from. Have a look over the hedge at the old place. This is the first time I've been back to my old home in years. So here we are. Not such a bad place, lots of green. House over there with a garden. There's the kids are all coming out from my old primary school. Hey. <laughs> They're better behaved than we were. <laughs> If you want to be on television, you have to tell me who the Prime Minister is. Um, David Cameron. That's a good answer. Um, OK, what else can we ask you if it's difficult? That'll who, be a hard one. Who's, do we know who the Deputy Prime Minister oh, is? Oh, um, what is it again? He's a Liberal Democrat. Nick Clegg. You're a star. <laughs> By the time I left for university, the first in my family ever to go, it seemed after Mr Wilson we really were living in the age of the grammar. To stay in this new meritocratic game, the Tories ditched their Grouse Moore image and chose Ted Heath to lead them, the grammar school educated son of a carpenter. She's out road now, look, she's coming towards us now. And then, most famously, a grammar school educated grocer's daughter from Grantham. People from my sort of background needed grammar schools to compete with children from privileged homes like Shirley Williams and Anthony Wedgwood Benn. And for a startling 33 years, from Harold Wilson to John Major, all our prime ministers were educated at state schools. The grammar school generation were taking on the public school kids at their own games and winning, even for the top job in the land. But by the early 80s, only a handful of grammars remained. Most had become comprehensives. Selection by ability was regarded as divisive. In Scotland, there are no grammar schools left. Mine still has the old name, but today it's what Alistair Campbell might call a bog-standard comprehensive. I remember this all right. <laughs> Most mornings we used to gather here. We all used to... We had to stand. We weren't allowed to sit. Everybody had to stand. The first year at the front, then as you got older, you were able to stand up in the balconies. But the one thing I'm doing, which I was n never able to do before, is I'm in this hall and I haven't got a tie on. That would have been unthinkable. The comprehensives were meant to widen opportunity, and for some they did. But overall, unlike the grammars, they struggled to compete with the private schools. A third of private pupils get at least three grade A's at A-level, compared to just 8% of comprehensive pupils. More students than ever are going to university, but most of the top universities are once again dominated by the public schools. And only 2% of their students had been on free school meals. But the head here still thinks the comprehensive system works. How's the school doing? Doing well, yeah. yes. Yeah. Great. When I was here, it was highly selective. Yeah. It's comprehensive school. Yeah. Yeah. And what difference has that made? I think it makes for a good difference in that we've got a range of kids with a range of abilities, mm. a range of skills, a range of backgrounds. So we've got extremely high achievers in terms of attainment. Mm. We've got high achievers in terms of music and sport. Mm. Um, and we've got others who achieve what is their potential. But is that really enough to match the fee-paying sector? 
How do you think the pupils here today compete with the kids that are going to the private schools? Well, they compete in the sense of university places, and we're successful in achieving that for them. And do you think that the, the academically gifted ones are getting as good an education as they got when I was here? Um, the teaching methodologies will be different. Yeah, very um, the different. range of abilities within some classes will be quite yeah. different, um, but the able kids still perform well. The examination board is now looking for... I'm sure some of the kids will do well, but I feel they won't be equipped to challenge their public school contemporaries as we did when I stalked these corridors. Well, Mr Dunbar is probably the reason people do history. For the strength of your argument as well as for the evidence which you put forward. The House of Commons really is a political club that is getting more exclusive, and I think they'll struggle to get in. It's not the same in the Scottish Parliament and Welsh Assembly, where there are far fewer products of private schools. The meritocracy is more intact in the devolved nations. But do pupils here think they're being equipped to fight for a place in the Commons? This history class is studying for their final exams in Scotland. They're called hires. Use the information. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Meet Mr O'Neill. Hello. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Come to visit good your morning. Class. Do you think that you can go to a school like this, as I did, you can do that and have a political career. I, I don't see why we shouldn't. I think that, like, at the end of the day, we're still, we get a good education here and we, and we work hard and get our hires. But is hard work enough? Or do these youngsters have one hand tied behind their back in competing with the public schools? In these public schools and in the funded schools, there's a sort of a sense of an old boys club. You have this connection and you're going to get furthered with that connection. That, that's an interesting point you make. It's about networks. Connections matter. Oh, it's a, they matter a lot because it's a very big reason. Most of our prime ministers have all gone to public schools, gone to very good universities because they've had that connection, they've had that chance. You think you have to work harder than the kids going to the private schools? I think we do because I don't know anyone that's ever went to Oxford or Cambridge or St Andrews and I would love to go to St Andrews but it's a very little chance that I'll get in. I just simply don't know anyone. It's called the Scottish Oxford for a reason. Rachel sums it up in one. If the public schools have a grip on places at the top universities, with the contacts they inevitably make there, they have a grip on the top jobs in Westminster afterwards. Consider today's breed of 40-something political leaders. They're the first post-grammar school generation. 30 years on from the end of the grammars, it's no coincidence that public school boys have triumphed. Without the grammars, there's simply less competition. And that means politics is missing out on a lot of potential. It's not just working class folk who are at a disadvantage. Even those from the mainstream middle class and most middle class kids go to state schools are struggling to compete with this new public school stranglehold on our politics. So it's not just a case of the poorest 10% struggling to get a rung on a ladder alongside the other 90%. It's a case of the 90% struggling to get a place alongside the top 10%. Best-selling author Tony Parsons, himself the son of a greengrocer, agrees the vast majority of us are missing out on opportunity. Now, the working class and the middle class are in this together. It's not a question of class warfare. It's not a question of being chippy. It's kids from ordinary homes. The overwhelming majority of children in this country that, whose parents desperately want them to get a good education, an excellent education, to be able to take on the pupils from anywhere and uh, they're not getting it. So does it matter to the coalition that so many of their top rank went to expensive public schools? Sarah Tether is the Lib Dem Minister of the Education Department. I think it matters that politicians at the moment don't represent the United Kingdom. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think it's good for trust in politicians. So, so the answer to your question is yes, I think it does. And I think the reasons for it are are probably quite subtle. They are partly about wealth. You know, we already see it's not just politics, but in journalism, at the top end of business, we also see similar patterns that if you come from a wealthier background, you're more likely to get a good education, so you're more likely to reach the top. You see, if we were sitting here in the 1950s, we'd be begin to see some social changes taking place, and we'd begin to see the beginnings of a meritocracy. We'd have seen it speeding up. Uh, in the 60s and into the 70s. 
and now it seems to be in reverse. I mean, are, are you aware of the figures of your coalition? You've got 119 ministers. 10% of you went to one public school, Eton. 66% of you were privately educated in a country where only 7% mm -hmm. of us are privately educated. Well, I think there's a lot that needs to change, and this is part of the reason why there's such a focus on the education system and also on, on preschool, because it isn't just about the school that you go to. The pattern between rich and poor is set long before you start school. But again, that was true in the 50s. That was true for people in my background. But we made it through with this coalition. It's tough. There's almost nobody from my kind of background in this coalition. Well, I said uh, things, things need to improve. And surprised but pleased, the leading light of this public school dominated coalition acknowledging we have a problem. Even though I'm skeptical, they've yet found the answer. Oxford, the next step in the pipeline to the top. It's become a virtual finishing school for politicians. Over the years, it's produced 26 prime ministers. There are over 100 universities across the UK, quite a few world class. So why did over 100 current MPs graduate from this one institution? Well, even more than Cambridge, Oxford is tailored to groom the political leaders of the future with its PPE course. That's philosophy, politics and economics. Eight of those who attend cabinet and half a dozen of the shadow cabinet studied it. It's about as classy an apprenticeship as you'll get in the trade of politics. Bill Johnson taught comprehensive educated Foreign Secretary William Hague and Energy Secretary Chris Hewn when they both read PPE here. Could you see that these were the politicians of the future? Oh, well, with William Hague, it was already clear because he'd been to the Conservative Party conference as a 16-year-old. And, I mean, I have to say that most of my colleagues were rather men of the left, and they groaned when they saw that he was in. So, oh, Lord, we don't want that sort of person doing. But, in fact, he was extremely good. And on merit, you had to have him, whatever you have thought about it. But it was quite clear he was always going to be a Conservative politician. You know. Bill Johnson's college, Maudlin, is arguably the classiest political finishing school of all. Five of its old boys sit round the cabinet table. There's more Maudlin men than there are women cabinet ministers of any background. You have a highly selective institution and uh, you get very good people and you teach them as hard as you can. It's not that surprising they do well. This business, this particular business of doing PPE at Oxford, I mean, it is, if you want a political career, that's doing your apprenticeship, isn't it? I found that that sort of take on events, seeing both the politics and the economics of a situation, uh, was a very important way of trying to understand what was going on around you. Uh, and that was true of both William and Chris, that they were that sort of person. We played rugby and cricket and hockey and tennis. So you've won that it's not just the high quality of the education that moulds future politicals. The networks made here by some from day one will sustain a career all the way to the top. Wow, there's a big turnout. And they start building their contact books here, the Oxford Union, the university's very own House of Commons for Beginners. Students debate here every week alongside leading political figures from all over the world. By some coincidence, tonight's topic is social mobility. The onus is on the proposition to show not just that birth is important and influential in people's lives, but that this is more influential than ability. And conversely... This evening, they're joined by Tony Blair's former chief speechwriter. I was intrigued by the reception that um, was given to two speeches of such obvious intellectual mediocrity. I was reminded... <laughs> <laughs> and a senior broadsheet commentator. Of 80,000 15-year-olds on preschool meals in 2002, only 45 got into Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, on a second note, I'd like to argue with the notion that university entrance is the sole arbiter of success in life. I would much rather someone be happy. The motion is passed. This House does believe that today birth matters more than ability. And the leg up from the connections made right here at the Union matters too. Why do so many presidents of this union go on to become politicians? Uh, I think because um, 
Well, obviously, a lot of presidents are very, very politically interested. You get a good training in debating, um, in how to run an institution. Um, you meet a lot of politicians when you're doing it, so it kind of, it kind of gives you some sense of the excitement of politics. Do they look like a bunch of budding politicians in there? Well, well they all are, aren't they? That's what the union is. It's just yeah. breeding ground for politicians, but the debates are interesting, so I'll come yeah. anyway. But that's, that's what they all do it for. It sort of it gives you a sense of the kind of continuity of the institution. Um, the list of former members here is a roll call from the front rank of political history. Nigel Lawson, he was Christchurch. Ken Baker, Maudlin. And the current cabinet. Oh, who's this chap in the killed here? That's got to be. That's uh, Michael Gove. Michael um, Gove. Ex-president, who is now the uh, government minister for schools and education. And it's not just the top posts in the coalition government that are dominated by Oxbridge. Fewer leading Labour figures may have gone to public school, but all five of last year's leadership contenders went to Oxford or Cambridge. So did a third of the shadow cabinet. Labour leader Ed Miliband went to Corpus Christi, a 2-1 in, you guessed it, PPE. Then pretty quickly into a job in Gordon Brown's office. Defeated David Miliband went to the same college. He got a first in PPE before going to a think tank and then on to advise Tony Blair. Shadow Chancellor Ed Bowles went to Keeble to study, yes, PPE. He too went on to work for Gordon Brown. At Oxford, he met his future wife, Yvette Cooper, now Shadow Home Secretary. She did PPE at Balliol before advising the late John Smith. Leadership contender, now Shadow Education Secretary, Andy Burnham, broke the pattern slightly. English at Fitzwilliam, Cambridge, but then off to advise Blair's Culture Secretary, Chris Smith. And they all ended up in the same place. Safe Labour seats in the Commons. If you give people a platform, they will and they can achieve. Labour conference in Manchester. There's no better place than this to spot the next generation of researchers and special advisors. They're the ones welded to their blackberries. So what can I tell you about these exotic creatures called spads, which is Westminster speak for a special advisor? Well, they come straight down from Oxford and Cambridge and go into the Westminster village. They join as researchers, not very well paid, or one of the think tanks, many of them splattered around Westminster. And very soon they work their way up the political greasy pole. Before long, they can become special advisors to well-known politicians on both front benches. And that's, that's the start of their political career. Before you know it, they become MPs themselves and then front benchers. And just as today's spads are tomorrow's politicians, today's top politicians are yesterday's spads. That includes all three main party leaders. Few of these young graduates have had a job outside politics. Now, if David Miliband decides not to take the job of Shadow Chancellor... And it isn't just Labour. I broadcast from all three of the big party conferences. So many of his supporters are still spitting tax about his defeat. And this new breed of professional political animal inhabits each of them. Thank you, it's very kind with, with of pleasure. Thank with you. Pleasure. Thank with you pleasure. very much. The Tories are the poshest. Both Cameron and Osborne's chiefs of staff are Eton old boys. And the female Tory spads tend to be just as upmarket. Rodine, St Paul's or Fetty's. To be a spad of any party is to be on the fast track to the top, and it hugely narrows the range of our politicians. That was all right. And they know all about that narrowing here in Stoke-on-Trent, about as Labour heartland as it gets. Rather than meet the new local MP, public school and Cambridge-educated Tristram Hunt, a close ally of Peter Mandelson, I'm meeting a man who's lived and worked all his life in the area, a man who last year was blocked by Labour HQ from even standing in the internal ballot that selected the parliamentary candidate. Before he resigned, Gary Owsby had been in the Labour Party for 30 years. Somebody born into a terrace like this could they make it into politics today? 
I think today you must be an Oxbridge type fellow. That's as far as I can, as far as I can um, see. Did you go to Oxford? No. no. Cambridge? No, no. Open university? Uni open university. <laughs> That's the only place for somebody like me. You think if you'd gone to Oxbridge, if you'd been better connected in the Labour Party, <laughs> you, might, you might now be MP for this city? If I had been a friend of Lord Mandelson uh, and I had gone to Cambridge or Oxford, I would have been in the MP for Sir Contrent today. So I having a network of friends that you gain in London and gain from going to an elite university, all that gives you yeah. a leg up. Yes, it does. And then you have to be a photocopy boy or a, a messenger boy or something like that. You have to get inside that inner circle. And when you're inside that inner circle, Mandelson's children, as they're called, they're implanted all over the country to do the bidding of those people in London mm. and not necessarily to be a voice of the people of the, the areas where they were born. It crucifies me to believe that this has actually happened to a working class party. Sounds to me that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Not according to Ed Miliband. It's all going to be rosy from now on. I'd like to see any some hard evidence that ordinary local people will be automatically on those shortlists and not automatically kept off them. I put to Peter Mandelson the allegation that he and others were responsible for keeping ordinary working class people off local shortlists. To my surprise, he agreed that politics has got too posh. You know, when I was young and growing up, you know, politicians were drawn from a whole variety of different professions. Now you're seeing the emergence of a generation of professional politicians. It's almost as if you had to be some MP's research assistant or a political advisor to a minister or, or a party worker or an official in a public sector trade union to get on in politics. So you're not just seeing the, the things getting posher, you're seeing things getting narrower as well. Easy for him to say now, but there's more. The man who did more than anybody to reduce the influence of the trade unions on Labour now blames them for not helping more ordinary people into politics. The trade unions, which used actually many decades ago to be a good recruiting ground actually for people coming from... From ordinary people? Ordinary, solid, working class, people who haven't made it, people who don't were certainly never born uh, with a silver spoon in their mouth. Now the, the trade unions too seem to be looking to that sort of professional political class. They should be doing a better job at recruiting more working class people into the Labour Party and into elected office. Whatever you think of them, the union certainly used to get people from humble origins to the top of the party they created. Then I'm sure the response of our people to make a new Britain will be as magnificent as the workers of Russia and other countries have been to improve their country. Men like Ernie Bevan, who went from Transport Union General Secretary to Foreign Secretary. And John Prescott, who went from Ship Steward to Shop Steward to Deputy Prime Minister. But Alan Johnson seems to be the last in that line of trade unionists who've made it to the top. He became Home Secretary, but he spent years here at Slough's sorting office as a posting. Morning. Where's Alan Johnson? Oh, there he is. Morning, Alan. Hi, Andrew. Good How you to doing? see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Just bring back some... All right, George. Yeah, see you later. Just bring back this some is... memories. I've known this guy since he was 16. He was a telegram boy uh, when I was here. And this is the old delivery I used to do as well. When you were doing this, did you ever think you would end up in a political career? No, never. No. Never, never at all. I delivered to Dorney Wood, which was the residence in those days yeah. of either the Foreign Secretary or the Home Secretary. It varied. Isn't that the place John Prescott got? That's right, that's right. <laughs> so and I said to John, croquet? well, I told John <laughs> when I became you an delivered M. delivered the mail there. I said to, no, I said to John, I said, you're at, you go to Dorney Wood? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, it's really nice as you walk in the front door and there's the, I said, I never walked in the front door, John. I went to the servants' quarters delivering the mail. <laughs> she did, you had to go round the back yeah. and just put the bundle of mail in. It was the unions that gave him a ladder to the top of politics. For someone of his generation and background, it was the only route in. 
I can't think of any other route where people came in other than the trade union movement without the Ox uh, university background, usually Oxbridge background. You had Nye Bevins and the Ernie Bevins, all of whom came for the trade union movement, and more recently John Prescott and me. W what's the other route that escaped that uh, treadmill? I can't think of one. But is that ladder still there today? Well, yeah. number one, of course, the trade union movement is not so... Uh, it's not the pipeline it was. It's not, well, it's still there. It's not as huge as it was, 13 million members in my day. It's not the pipeline it was, no. It pr probably could be again. It's about 60 new MPs came in at the last election. And you look at the backgrounds of these Labour MPs, they're pretty middle class. We can only see, out of the 60, about six yeah. coming from what you would describe as ordinary working class backgrounds. Yeah. Now that's Labour. Yeah, uh, well, as I say, I think that's changing. I think, you know, in constituency parties, they're going to be looking for a mix. Now, will you get the people going and standing for those positions who haven't got that kind of background? How you perhaps train them to go to these constituency selection meetings, you were talking about yeah. the confidence that a university gives you. Well, if you haven't had that, you haven't had the huge benefit that a trade union career gives you, incidentally. H how can you help people? None of the parties has been much good in recent years at encouraging people from ordinary backgrounds to stand for election. Of course, diversity has become very fashionable, getting more women, more ethnic minorities, more openly gay candidates. Even the Tories are all for it, but by and large, they all come from the same posh backgrounds. One new black Tory MP even went to Eton. What about some social diversity? We've had all women shortlists who become MPs. What about some old state school shortlists? I think at, at that stage it's, going, it's an issue about income. I mean, those are the barriers that prevent people at that stage from going into politics. Getting into politics is an expensive business. My fear is we're going back to a time when only those with money can afford to become MPs. When you see the leaders of this coalition, Mr Cameron, Mr Hume, Walls, Mr Laws as well, Mr Clegg, it's kind of back to the 50s, isn't it? They're not just posh, they are moneyed as well. It's well, sort of like the kind of younger version of Harold Macmillan's cabinet. It is an issue that concerns me a great deal. And when I'm going around trying to, to encourage people to think about standing for politics, it's, it is an obvious barrier. And it's not until you begin that process, you always realise just how bad those financial barriers are. Financial barriers are yet another obstacle blocking ordinary people's route into politics. One result, the feeling that the leaders of the coalition and their families are immune from the impact of their own policies. As they force through sweeping cuts to public services, will they have the moral authority to bring the electorate with them? Or will they end up paying the price at the ballot box? Easter House, on the outskirts of Glasgow. Male life expectancy here is up to 15 years lower than the national average. Can privileged politicians brought up a world away really understand what it's like to live here? FAIR is an independent youth centre which thrives despite no cash from central government. Yeah, he's my best bud, right? So look, that's him. Chris came here as a kid and now helps run the place. I work in Westminster. Within the sound of Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, the Houses of Parliament. This is a long way away. It's a long, long, long way. <laughs> That's no Big Ben in the back there anyway. Um, Looks more fun. <laughs> well, I've never been there, so I don't know. But you must just wonder if the people in Westminster, whatever their parties, do they understand what's going on here? I don't think they do. I, I think they're from a, a different planet, from a, a housing scheme like Easter House. Um, I think you have to be brought up in an area like, like Easter House to understand we, as in the community, how poverty affects people's decisions about what harms in life. <laughs> Bob Holman helped found FAIR when he moved here nearly 20 years ago. Do you think the politicians, whether they're on the left or the right or the centre, do they understand what these children need? Oh, on the whole, no. There, there are some exceptions. Ian Duncan Smith. He's exception. been here. He's been here several times. But I, I think many are, you know, in, in, in the present coalition government, 16 are millionaires. Uh, 
they wouldn't know what life is like here. And they seem to have the impression that people here aren't making the effort. And even the party people here traditionally support seems increasingly remote. I'm a member of the Labour Party, 47 years. I've refused to vote this year because I couldn't vote for a working class candidate. Um, and, and that's got to change. The absence of a single one? Yep. But who, who knows? I think it might be getting worse before it gets better. It, it may, but funnily enough, the cuts are going to make it worse for people here, but it might also be the spark for action. <laughs> It's not just poorer people who feel so remote from our leaders. Middle-class people do too. Edgebaston's a pretty middle-class constituency in Birmingham, and it was an important target seat for the Tories to win at the last election. But Labour held on to it. Why? Andrew Cooper should know. He's a pollster who's worked extensively with the Conservative campaign team. So it was a failure to win seats like this that meant they didn't get an overall majority. Exactly right. How do voters in general look at the social class of their political elite and the backgrounds of their politicians? Well, one of the questions we ask is, do they think that the parties are for ordinary people, not just the best of? 47% think this is true of the Liberal Democrats. The Liberal Democrats are for ordinary people. More than half, even now, after a defeat, 52% think Labour are for ordinary people, not just the best of, but for the Tories, 31%, less than a third of people in this country think that the Tory party are for ordinary people. So could we really say that if the Tory party wasn't perceived to be as posh as it now seems to be, they might have won an overall majority? We can certainly say that if more people believed that the Conservative party was for ordinary people, it may well have won a majority, and the perception that its leaders are posher than, than ordinary people is an important part of that, yes. One, two, one, two, three, four. You don't have to look too far back to remember when Tory politicians were at all perceived as posh. Who is the leader who really can lead Maggie Thatcher? Mr and Mrs Parker applied to buy the house because they liked it very much. When they could reach out to ordinary voters and win their support. It was a classless revolution. It's Thatcher for me. One, two, three, four. Thatcher, 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 not a man around to match her. David Davis seemed to epitomise the party's newfound classlessness until he was beaten by David Cameron for the leadership. We spoke to a, a pollster who studied the last election very carefully and his findings were the perceived poshness of the Tory leadership had been a negative in the election campaign, had cost the Tories' votes, maybe even an overall majority. Mm. I don't know, I mean, the, the, the old argument was uh, that, back in the 50s and earlier, that the, uh, about half of the, the Tory vote was deferential. And quite clearly, that vote actually preferred um, people from uh, an upper or upper middle class background. Well, they thought the Harold McMillans of this world should run the country. Well, ideally, that's true. And today's voter, uh, working class or otherwise, is much more aspirational. But I've, I've got no doubt that some will say, are they like us? Are they people like us? Um, that's always been a part in politics. And so they you know, will tend to work against somebody who's clearly privileged. I think that the Tories failed to win an overall majority because they didn't really have a message for the C1s. Mm. Mrs Thatcher had a message for them, for the Strivers. Tony Blair had a message for them as well. Yeah. The Conservatives didn't, and they were perceived by these people to be posh. So they were posh people without a message for these people. Yeah, the, the so-called squeezed middle and so yeah. on. But they, these, are, these are classic. They, they used to be working-class Conservatives. These are classically the aspirational group. These are the ones who actually want to get on. And as a result, they tend to want to vote for people like them. I mean, Essex man saw Mrs. Thatcher as people like them, you know. And I think, yes, a more inclusive perspective would have, would have actually brought some of those votes back in. Well, let me ask the Leninist question. What is to be done? <laughs> <laughs> it's not just the Leninist question. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, we've, we've got to find a way of reinstating social mobility. So what is to be done? 
Surely the key must lie in our education system and finding a way to help state school kids level the playing field with their public school counterparts. But of course, for today's politicians, even those who themselves were the products of grammars like Peter Mandelson, bringing back any sort of selection in state schools is a solution that dare not speak its name. The old bogey of the 11 plus always rears its ugly head. When you look back, the comprehensive school experiment, which was a great experiment to widen opportunity even more, would it not be honest to say, looking back, that it hasn't delivered in the way people hoped? No, because what it's done is to remove that appalling selection at the age of 11, in which people on almost, you know, sitting in exam, almost the flip of a coin, you know, were people who were going to go on and go through their grammar school and enter the professions, and those who were, you know, forever and a day relegated to, you know, frankly, not only a different type of education, but a lesser sort of education. All three big parties are unanimous that a return to grammar schools isn't the answer. And the reason why? Curves Green is a secondary school for children who failed the 11 plus. They shudder at the very memory of the secondary moderns. And I agree, nobody wants a return to the black and white system of the 50s and 60s. The 11 plus was far too brutal a watershed, consigning those who failed to second rate secondary moderns. But today, would it not be possible to have some selection by ability in the state system, more sophisticated, more flexible than back then, without consigning anyone to the dustbin, giving as much emphasis to good vocational schools as academic hothouses? Unless we do, I feel the highly selective public schools will continue to rule the roost. Everything else the politicians suggest, from Tony Blair's academies to the Tories' free schools, seems just tinkering. And what are you going to do, Wendy? Hairdressing. Are you hairdressing? Yes, sir. Because you want something neat and tidy and something to do with your hands? Yes, sir. Well, you never were one for GCE courses, were you? No, sir. Never mind. And some do mind that the political establishment closes down debate on selection in the state system. You're not really allowed to say, bring back the grammar schools, but that's what we need to do. You would do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely, bring back, because they worked. I don't think um, anyone in their right mind wants to pull down the private schools. You know, that we need as many great private schools as we can. But kids from ordinary homes, from ordinary working and middle class homes that don't have parents who can afford a few grand a term, they should be allowed to compete on an equal playing field. Sadly, that seems a pipe dream. Politics is increasingly geared towards the privileged few who have parents that can pay for expensive public schools, who have formed the right networks at university and worked in the main party's central offices. Today's political elite on the left and right is unanimous in opposing the kind of reforms to our state schools that would reignite the meritocratic revolution. As a result, we're likely to be even more governed in the years ahead by a narrow elite, unrepresentative of the kind of people we are. In other words, our politicians are already posh, they're about to become even posher. The meritocracy, it died around the turn of the century from a mixture of neglect and hypocrisy. May it rest in peace, but I hope it doesn't.